During the final weeks of the Tunisian campaign, particularly after the outcome could be definitely foreseen, major staffs were busy planning our next campaign. At Casablanca in January 1943, plans for our future conduct of the war against Hitler were developed. Alternative missions for the Mediterranean forces were discussed by the combined chiefs of staff. One of these was to assault Sicily without delay. The other was to capture Sardinia and Corsica. The Casablanca conference directed that the next campaign was to be the capture of Sicily. Sicily abuts both Africa and Italy so closely that it practically severs the Mediterranean, and its capture would greatly reduce the hazards of using that sea route. With Sicily ours, the next step would be clear, to attack the enemy on the European continent itself. Development of the Sicilian plan, assigned the code name Husky, began in February. North Africa became the platform from which the invasion of Europe was to be launched. Sustaining an offensive on European soil for an extended period constituted a major problem in supply. Equipment which would be needed months later had to be shipped to North Africa and prepared for use in the oncoming campaign. We felt that some five or six divisions should be deployed in the initial landing. These forces were to attack Sicily in early July and all preparation was based upon keeping of that target date. Study indicated the desirability of first seizing the island of Pantelleria, lying roughly between Sicily and the northeastern coast of Tunisia. It possessed an airfield which we badly needed in order to supply additional air support for the Sicilian attacks. This island was popularly known as the Gibraltar of the central Mediterranean. We believed that if the island were subjected to an intensive air bombardment, the assault would be relatively easy. In a period of six days and nights, approximately 5,000 tons of high explosives were dropped on the eastern portion of the island. experienced commanders and staff officers strongly advised against attempting this operation since any failure would have a disheartening effect on the troops to be committed against the Sicilian shore. In the actual outcome, the capture of Pantelleria was so easy that few people had any inkling of the doubts and fears that had to be overcome in launching the operation. Come on there, shake it up. The invasion of Pantelleria proved an interesting and valuable experiment. The reduction of the island and the surrender of its garrison of 11,000 Italian soldiers marked the first time in any war that an enemy position had been overcome virtually by air bombardment alone. The underground hangars built by Mussolini's order were of little avail in the island's defense. With its airfield in our possession, we could step up air attacks on Sicily. We further improved our air position by building a new field on the island of Gozzo, just off Malta. The terrain of Gozzo was so difficult that there was, at first, little hope of producing a field there. This view proved unduly pessimistic. Thirteen days from the time the first American construction unit stepped on the island, the first fighter plane was taking off from the strip. This gave us an additional base from which to sustain our attack against Sicily. At Malta, the Allies made final plans to invade Sicily with the American 7th and the British 8th Armies in early July. I went to Malta a day or so before the attack was scheduled to be in position to take any action that might prove necessary. The first major assault on the enemy on European soil was launched chiefly from North African ports. It was a vast, complex operation with 2,500 ships needed to transport the first wave of the invasion forces. Among the troops which were to lead the assault were battle-tested veterans, American GIs who had landed at Casablanca and fought their way across Africa, and British Tommies who had faced the German Africa Corps in the African Desert Campaign.
The ship convoys bringing the troops to their allotted places had to come from ports stretched throughout the length of the Mediterranean. The timing and final maneuvering of the various naval columns had to be exactly performed in the minefilled waters. The men were given their final briefing. Everything was proceeding with seeming perfection. Allied warships bombarded the invasion beaches for a number of hours. We were using airborne troops in the operation on a much larger scale than had yet been attempted in warfare. The first troops scheduled to reach the island were these airborne contingents. In the wind and storm, it was difficult for them to keep direction. As the paratroopers jumped high above the shores of Sicily, the high wind dispersed them and altered the course of their descent. The parachutists landed on the southern front, although in certain instances far from their appointed landing grounds. The weather, which in that part of the Mediterranean is normally serene in summer, began to deteriorate so badly as to threaten our ability to land. Since the wind direction was generally from the west, it was the southern beaches for which we were anxious. The eastern beaches would have the shelter of the island itself. Naval personnel has a habit of referring to wind velocity in terms of force. For me, this had to be translated into miles per hour. But I had no difficulty in realizing that force five was worse than force four. The day wore on and the wind velocity increased alarmingly. There was nothing we could do but pray, desperately. We had thought it possible that the Admiral in charge of the assault convoy might even postpone the transfer to small boats for several hours, hoping for better weather conditions. It was difficult to believe that landings in that area were feasible. The landings in the 45th Division sector constituted a fine exhibition of seamanship. On both flanks, the landings from the sea seemed to be proceeding well, with only moderate opposition. Up to that moment, no amphibious attack in history had approached this one in size. Along miles of coastland, there were hundreds of vessels and small boats afloat, and ant-like files of advancing troops ashore. It was July 10th, 1943, and Allied troops were on European soil at last. The battle to the death with the Nazi war machine was about to be joined. As battle reports began to arrive, it was evident that the enemy had been badly deceived as to the point of our attack. During the first two days, against little opposition, the Allies landed 80,000 men and put ashore 300 tanks and large quantities of other mobile pieces of equipment. Our foothold was established. In command of the U.S. 7th Army was General George S. Patton, Jr., who was given the assignment following his success in North Africa. The enemy's best formations were located largely on the western end of the island, which he had apparently believed we would select for attack. His reaction was typical. He pushed east and south to attack the American 1st Division at Jela. dug in and waited. The German counterattack seriously threatened the Allied foothold, and Allied warships quickly went into action. For many hours, we met the enemy head-on in a bitter battle.
The enemy was stopped dead. Allied troops seized the offensive and drove the Nazis back. This was but the first of many withdrawals the Nazis would be forced to make all over Europe. The vaunted Nazi Wehrmacht did not look so mighty in defeat. The Nazis' only chance to slash the Allies to pieces had been unsuccessful, and a complete Allied conquest of the island was inevitable. Equally important, the enemy's air power on Sicily was thoroughly destroyed by the Allies. Our troops moved forward in a drive to complete the conquest of the island as quickly as possible. General Patton was a shrewd student of warfare who always clearly appreciated the value of speed in the conduct of operations. Veteran troops realized that by continuing the advance and attack against a shaken enemy, the greatest possible gains are made at minimum cost. The point the Allies wanted to capture at the earliest possible moment was Messina, the enemy port directly across the narrow strait from the Italian mainland. Mount Etna dominates the whole northeast corner of the island, and the 8th Army's route to the northward lay over a narrow road along the seaward shoulder of the mountain. General Patton, in the meantime, pushed forward to the center of the island, entering Palermo within 12 days after the initial landing. Patton's rapidity of movement broke the morale of the huge Italian garrison. On July 22nd, Palermo was captured with little opposition. Rolling through the city on its way east toward Mount Etna, where the Nazis were making a last desperate stand, the American 7th Army was greeted by the complacent Sicilian townsfolk. General Eisenhower visited the conquered city on August 1st on a tour of inspection of the area now controlled by the Allies. The higher commander must constantly plan as each operation progresses, so to direct his formations that success finds his troops in proper position and condition to undertake successive steps without pause. Patton employed these tactics relentlessly and thus minimized casualties. Before completing the conquest of Sicily, Allied troops still faced some bitter fighting and some extremely rugged terrain. In the advance eastward from Palermo, the left flank of the 7th Army, following the coastline, advanced along the rocky coastal cliffs of Sicily. The only road was of the shelf variety, a mere niche in the cliffs interrupted by numerous bridges and culverts that the enemy invariably destroyed as he drew back fighting. The advance along the coastline toward Messina by the 7th Army was a triumph of engineering and gallant infantry action. Meanwhile, the British were assaulting the enemy on the island's eastern coast. The British 8th Army's attack initially proceeded swiftly and quickly overran the eastern beaches to include the Nazi port of Syracuse, most important to our supply plant. Montgomery's operations on the east coast had begun auspiciously. But by the time he was ready to assault the natural defensive barriers running from Mount Etna to the sea, the enemy had brought up too much strength. Thereafter, the northward path of the 8th Army was fully as difficult from the terrain viewpoint as was the eastward advance on the left of the 7th Army. In addition, the 8th Army had to overcome the preponderance of enemy strength. As the 7th Army approached the western slopes of the Mount Etna Highlands, fighting became more and more severe. In its path lay the peaceful little town of Troina. Troina is roughly 20 miles west of Mount Etna. The 7th Army's immediate objective lay in a narrow valley surrounded by imposing ridges. The countryside was rocky and covered with brambles, and from positions on the ridges, the defenders were ideally situated. 
for their guns could command every square yard of territory beneath. Mechanized units of the 7th Army moved forward to advantageous positions in preparation for the start of the battle at Troina. As stealthily as possible, the stage was set for the attack. To the foot soldier, the terrain was about the worst encountered so far. The roads twisted through the valley, and everywhere the German guns covered them from the slopes. The job was to blast those slopes, and then to capture them one by one. The Allies were ready. Troina, conducted largely by the 1st Division, was one of the most fiercely fought smaller actions of the war. The enemy launched 24 separate counterattacks during the battle. The ground was rocky and broken, with hidden areas difficult to clean out. After the capture of the position, our troops were astonished to find in one small valley a field of several hundred German dead, so far uncounted. They were victims of American artillery fire. After a week of the most savage fighting, the hungry, battle-weary American troops entered what was left of the town of Troina. They found the inhabitants, who had survived two days of incessant bombing and shelling, still dazed by the nightmare that was the Battle of Troina. Most of the Sicilian people were overjoyed when, on July 25th, the bombastic Duce was summarily deposed as Premier of Italy by the order of King Victor Emmanuel. The battle for Sicily ended abruptly at Messina on August 17th with the final surrender of 135,000 Axis soldiers. The results of the Sicilian campaign were more far-reaching than the mere capture of the enemy garrison. The Italians wanted frantically to surrender. However, they wanted the assurance that such a powerful allied force would land on the mainland simultaneously with their surrender, that the government itself and their cities would enjoy complete protection. Leading the assault in the south, General Sir Bernard Montgomery was scheduled to slip across the strait with two British divisions and make the invasion of continental Europe an accomplished fact. The assault was to be launched from Messina, last enemy stronghold to fall in Sicily. During the first days of September, British Tommies went aboard ship in preparation for the landing only six miles away across the strait. The invading forces were two crack units, the 5th and Canadian divisions of the British 8th Army. The moment when we would come to grips with the enemy on his home continent was at hand. In the hours just before dawn on September 3rd, the fourth anniversary of Britain's declaration of war, the assault wave set out. Just across the Strait of Messina on the Italian coast, the spearheads of the attacking force landed near Reggio Calabria against almost no resistance, and a 10-mile beachhead was quickly established. With their foothold on European soil made secure, Montgomery's men were now started on their job of forcing the enemy back without let-up. The entire stretch of Italian coast, bordering the Strait of Messina, on both sides of the landing beaches, was soon completely under Allied control. Montgomery immediately started an advance up the toe of the boot. His troops were carefully watched by the enemy, anxious to detect our major move. At Algiers in late May of 1943, the Allied High Command had weighed every consideration involved in the overall strategy of the invasion of Italy. A major factor was the possibility of an Italian surrender to coincide with our landings. The Italians wanted frantically to surrender. However, they wanted the assurance that such a powerful allied force would land on the mainland that the government itself and their cities would enjoy complete protection. Simultaneously with the hoped for Italian surrender, the plan called for the Italian mainland to be invaded by allied forces at two additional points on the west coast at Salerno, 
British and American troops were to make the assault. At the same time, a smaller force of British troops was to land at Toronto in the arch of the boot. The negotiations for the Italian surrender dragged along. But finally, word crossed the world that Italy had capitulated. It was agreed that the surrender should become effective on the evening of September 8th. I chose that date because at midnight, our Salerno attack would begin. In the Mediterranean in September 1943, the Italian fleet, still a powerful striking force consisting of more than a hundred warships, was surrendered to the Allies. General Eisenhower himself reviewed the array of surrendered Italian war vessels, no longer a menace to our movement in the Mediterranean. As the day for the invasion of Salerno approached, convoys were crossing the Mediterranean from several directions. American troops had embarked on their transports at Oran in North Africa and Palermo in Sicily. British troops had boarded ship in Bizerta in Tripoli in North Africa. The American Fifth Army, which was to make the Salerno assault, was commanded by Lieutenant General Mark Clark, General Eisenhower's former deputy, who was getting his first taste of action in World War II. En route to the point of attack, the invasion forces were given their final briefing. The last minute preparations for battle followed a now familiar pattern. For hours on end, the men cleaned and checked their weapons and then enjoyed their last chance to relax for some time to come. All hands, man your battle station! Man your battle station! With the landing still 12 hours away, some of the ships and the convoys were attacked by enemy planes, intent on beating off the invasion by sinking some of our vessels and their invaluable cargo of assault troops. But our Navy gun crews were equal to the challenge. By this time, with H hour drawing closer, our intentions were becoming clear to the enemy. With the equivalent of four divisions in the assault, we were invading a country in which there were estimated to be 18 German divisions. Although follow-up troops would double the initial assault strength, in some respects, the operation looked foolhardy. The Allied troops landed at dawn on September 9th along a 25-mile stretch south of Salerno. The Italian surrender had little effect on the Nazis' stubborn resistance. For two weeks, the Germans had prepared defensive positions covering the beachhead, and the invading British and American troops had a tough time establishing a foothold. The landing and succeeding operations developed almost identically to our intelligence predictions. It was a sharp but relatively short fight in getting ashore, and with minor exceptions, the details of the actual landing proceeded well. By afternoon of the invasion day, the enemy's chance of annihilating our position was lessened considerably. But the enemy was not giving up that early. With every weapon at their disposal, the Germans, under the command of Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, kept pounding at the Allies' limited beachhead. Nazi reinforcements were brought up, and from the high ground inland, the Nazis still kept the beaches under constant fire. On September 13th, the German attack struck in all its fury, and fierce fighting ensued for a considerable period. The German attack pushed forward to within two or three miles of the beach. The outlook became gloomy. The battle for Salerno was bitterly contested. On our success in beating off the German counterattacks, depended the whole future pattern of the war against Hitler.
The Allies finally had a more secure beachhead after seven days of intense fighting. But they paid a high price. Losses were heavy. Hundreds of Allied dead and wounded. Among the first of millions of casualties to be suffered by the Western Allies in capturing the Nazi fortress of Europe. The enemy still had to be driven back from the area surrounding the landing beaches. Allied warships played a major part in affecting the Nazi withdrawal. Allied bombers from North African bases continued the bombardment of the enemy's positions. In one 24-hour period, 1,400 tons of bombs were dropped on the stubbornly resisting Nazis. The Allied forces were now in position for a general advance, which soon turned into a full-scale offensive. With the 5th Army advancing steadily in all sectors of the front, the enemy was forced to fall back. The Nazi withdrawal, accompanied by only sporadic delaying action, enabled the Allies to consolidate their gains in the area surrounding Salerno. The long, arduous battle for Italy was now underway. A campaign which was to become known as one of the most exhausting major operations of the war. The Italian campaign was already proving extremely difficult on the tactical level. The natural terrain advantages which the Nazis enjoyed in their defensive role combined with the weather to make the job ahead an especially tough one for Allied commanders. Meanwhile, in the south, Montgomery was taking advantage of the Nazis' preoccupation with the Salerno assault to proceed quickly up the toe and shin of the boot. On September 16th, advance elements of the British 8th Army met some of General Clark's 5th Army troops south of Salerno, and the Allies had an effective hold on southern Italy. In his commander of the U.S. 5th Army, General Eisenhower had complete confidence Clark was a relatively young man, but an extremely able professional, with a faculty for picking fine assistants and for developing a high morale within his staff. I gained a lasting respect for his planning, training, and organizing ability, which I have not seen excelled in any other officer. When General Clark led the 5th Army into Salerno, he had not previously participated in any of the fighting of World War II. He proved to be a fine battle leader, and fully justified the personal confidence that had impelled me to assign him to such an important position. One of the most important prizes in our path in southern Italy was the enemy air base at Foggia. Encountering limited resistance, British troops captured that prize in late September. It placed important objectives from Germany to the Black Sea within range of our bombers and denied the enemy an important base from which to attack our advancing troops. To the north of Salerno, in the U.S. 5th Army's path, lay Naples, which our forces entered triumphantly on October 1st, 1943. Naples had been one of the Nazis' principal port cities and marked a notable advance for the Allies on the road to Rome. When American troops entered the city, they found the remains of a legendary center of cultural life. In taking Naples, the Allies had been forced to bomb and shell the city severely. Whatever survived that assault had also to withstand the demolition set by the retreating Germans. Much of the damage to Naples was the work of the Germans. The city was subjected to as savage demolition and bombing as any other population center so far captured in Italy. Within the ruined city, the business of daily life was paralyzed. The Germans had been so thorough in sacking Naples that it was like a phantom city, dazed and silent. In the devastated city were nearly a million people who must be provided with at least the bare necessities of life. Most of the surviving Neapolitans were suffering acutely from thirst after the destruction by the fleeing Nazis of the city's water supply system. 
The urgent craving for water and food became the chief obsession of the people. The final German job of scuttling was a delayed operation. Thirteen days after they had evacuated the city, the post office blew up following the explosion of a German time bomb. There were scores of casualties. The port facilities of Naples were a complete wreck. Ships had been sunk by the Germans to block the piers, so that when the Allies entered, there was not one full berth available. Other ships had been sunk to block channels. Retaining walls for some piers had been blown up. The port was completely unusable. But the port did not remain in that condition for long. The combination of engineers and sea salvage experts who had constantly amazed us with their exploits in the rehabilitation of harbors immediately went to work. All of their prior successes at Casablanca, Algiers, Oran, Bizerta, and Palermo were as nothing compared to the speed and efficiency with which they repaired the seemingly destroyed and useless harbor facilities at Naples. On October 10, 1943, only 10 days after the Allied liberation of Naples, the port was handling a tonnage equivalent to the peacetime capacity of 6,000 tons. On a single day, Naples port workers sometimes unloaded as much as five times the peacetime high. With the port repaired and once again in operation, Desperately needed equipment and supplies were brought in to bring some relief to the stricken city. Through the Allied military government, the food so vitally needed to prevent wholesale starvation was quickly made available to the Italian people. For many inhabitants, the Allied liberation came just in time. After months of malnutrition, Neapolitans could look forward to eating regularly again. Slowly, Naples was rising again from its ruins. Under the guidance of American military officials, Italian workmen set eagerly about the task of rebuilding their historic city. During the first month after the liberation, electric power was restored. With its public utilities functioning, life began again for the 800,000 Neapolitans who had lived through the ordeal of Nazi occupation. While the summer and fall fighting was in full swing, we received word that President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill and their staffs were preparing to hold another joint meeting, this time near Cairo. It appeared to me and to my associates at the Cairo conference that the British still favored a vigorous and all-out prosecution of the Mediterranean campaign, even if necessary, at the expense of additional delay in launching the cross-channel invasion, while the Americans declined to approve anything that would detract from the strength of the attack to be delivered across the channel early in the following summer. In Sicily, after the conference, General Eisenhower had the opportunity to renew private talks with the president. His conversation revolved more around post-war problems than those of immediate operations. He gave me his ideas on the post-hostilities occupation of Germany and listened sympathetically to my contention that occupation should become a responsibility of civil agencies of government as soon as the exigencies of war might permit. He mentioned domestic politics only to say that much as he'd like to go back to private life, it looked as if he'd have to stand again for the presidency.